one week season. OWS fam, the nation, my dudes and dudettes, we are back with another installment of the Industry Experts podcast series for the Best Ball Plus product at OneWeekSeason.com. You know the deal by now. We'll bring you these every Friday. Um, and today we've got an awesome guest lined up that I have not talked to in a very, very long time. But me and this guest go way back, and I'm super stoked to talk about what is going on around the industry. And you know him, but without further ado, I will bring him in, Mr. John Warner. How are we doing today, my dude? Good, Mark. Good, man. Good to see you, dude. It's been a minute. Know, it's weird. Yeah. I know. We were just talking before we started recording here that like we used to do these weekly. We used to do these more than weekly, um, you know, a couple of years ago. And now it's like we're, we're busy men now. <laughs> it's hard to get together, but I am still growing up, baby. We're growing I know, up. dude. Right. It's crazy. If you don't know John, follow John on Twitter. His um, is twitter handle whatever x handle on I, I don't even know what to call anymore dude but um uh is on the screen at roto underscore run if you're not familiar with his work over at uh badge bros what are you doing get out of your uh from under your rock go follow john go follow badge bros they're doing awesome work in the industry um but yeah without further ado man what's going on with you lately give yourself a quick shout if i did not just cover it and then we'll jump in here yeah, I mean, we're doing the Underdog Daily show there, so we're focused heavily on uh, some of the season-long basketball stuff right now. Obviously, we're drafting maybe two or three of those on stream a week. Uh, we basically stream Monday through Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. We do a show on Wednesday with Pete Overzed there, which is always like our kind of like flagship football show, uh, and then a lot of the daily stuff. So we've been doing uh, everything from daily hoops to daily WNBA to daily MLB. Like We're just covering it all. We mix in some golf sometimes there and it's just like you know same game different names uh each day so we've been mixing in tons of stuff like that it's a lot of fun anything that's played on underdog fantasy uh we do it on underdog daily so it's it's been good man it's been uh it's been really fun i never really kind of thought i would go like head first dive into this yeah. like streaming avenue stuff like you and i have both talked about how like we love these games we love the theoretics behind these games we love playing these games but i never thought i would be like you know, full-fledged streamer, bro. And here we are two years later, three years later or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And you go, you and I go way back. We try to start a company together. We try to do a lot of different stuff together. Um, so it's cool to see the successes that you've had over there, man. Um, and is it just you and Nez now, obviously with, uh, with Numi over there working for underdog now? Yeah. So when, once Numi jumped on full time, it was just the two of us, but we've been bringing in lots of guests and stuff like that yeah. along the way. We've been doing some fun stuff. Uh, Crane, Herzig, Leone, um, you know, the, the the names around the industry you know we got to get you back on yeah dude for sure i would love to hop back on um and jam about anything really uh probably not the best guy to have on for golf but uh <laughs> 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 we'll tackle that when it comes maybe i'll give me a 24-hour notice and i'll prep um <laughs> yeah dude so there's one big thing happening around the industry right now that i think we should cover we should talk about um I alluded to the fact that we tried to start a company together. Um, so we have a little bit of understanding of <clears throat> what goes on behind the scenes um, when running a company like this. So I think it's pertinent. Um, and speaking directly to um, some tools that have come out that are may or may not be classified as RTA, um, real-time assist for those not familiar, um, may or not be classified as pure tools. Um, what are your thoughts about kind of what's been growing in the industry and where do we go from here? Basically. Um, I think I would start by saying, I get it. I get it. I get that people, um, are apprehensive. They're a little scared of the boogeyman. They're scared of, uh, this turning into sim wars all over again. They're scared yeah. of that. So I, I, I empathize and I sympathize with the community that wants to protect this game. And I do think there is something beautiful about best ball being like a little bit like it, like trending towards unsolved it being the phone shitter bro game. It being the game that you can just fire up a draft on your phone, click your favorite players. And you know, you have a chance at a couple million bucks. I respect the heck out of that. The, the counter to it is any Avenue of life where there's life changing money up for grabs, people are going to find ways to beat it. People yes. are going to find ways to cheat it. People are going to find, you know, like this is all inevitable 
uh, life cycle of any game. I don't care if the game is uh, Call of Duty, if it's poker, if it is rock, paper, scissors. People are going to find a way to win this arc. And the more premium the prizes become, the more that people can, the more information and data which is available that people can run EV calcs on and back test information on, the more they're going to be incentivized to realize some form of equity edge. So that's just kind of like setting the table. That mm-hmm. being said, everything that I have seen up until this point, in my humble opinion, does not defy terms of services, does not defy um, what we should be kind of fearful of yet. I, I think that's what I would say thus far. I would have to agree with you, honestly. And um adding to all the reasons that you talked about and everything in that kind of like meta of games, you know, we're, we know that like, this is life changing money that is changing hands every year. Um, you know, few people are going to realize that, uh, but it, it happens and it's there to be had. It's the same thing. I love that you bring up rock, paper, scissors when talking about this discussion, because it, everybody is familiar with the game. Everybody understands the rules. Uh, so how do you gain an edge in that? Well, it's the same thing looking at any game that's available, right? Like people are going to be we, like, that is the competitive spirit of these games is like, people are going to be pushing the envelope. So in that understanding of like, this is where we've come from. This is where we are. Mm-hmm. When we're developing our game plan and our strategy to beat this game, where now we have these tools that are coming into the marketplace, we have to accept that. And build that into like our decision making process, right? Like, if you don't, you're going to be left behind. So, mm-hmm. like, this is where we are. How do we go from here? We have to kind of start thinking about these things. Is like, we, we I use this the a buzz term like common knowledge. Like, it is something that is known in a game by every player, every participant that also knows every other participant knows. If you put something, a, a piece of information into that common knowledge assumption bucket now you can build your strategy from there um you can tailor your strategy you can alter your decision making process so without like getting into like all of what those changes are um if you're looking for those you're gonna have to peek behind the the paywall curtain Uh, (laughs) (laughs) but um yeah that it's it it is something that we have to accept and move on from and we're not going to talk about like is it a violation of the terms of service? Like that's all going to work itself out. But if we're sitting right here where we are, like we have to assume now that, Hey, rosters, roster construction or playoff correlation or week 17 correlation or team stacking or all the things that are probably understood by 70%, maybe more of the field, that number is probably going to increase. So like, how do we, well, I would just say it's interesting to choose that number because I was going to literally ask you what you think the number of like oh, utilization yeah, of no tools and uh, what do you think the number is of the field? Because I think the people that reject the tools, I think it's because of a little bit of naivety in the terms of like they think their edge is greater than it actually is with yeah. some of these common knowledge pr- principles right now. Like what you refer to as common knowledge, I often call table stakes. Um, it's just... <laughs> Okay, I think in terms of like realizing your equity in these games over a long period of time, you're going to have to put so, so much money down, so much time, so much effort to to do so that like if you're doing it purely to be a profitable endeavor with like tools, you're doing it for the wrong reasons anyways. So I'm not overly concerned. I, I guess I think the biggest thing for me is protecting the time investment because the minute you take the time investment away, that's when the pendulum swings for me because the time investment is what separates us as a drafting uh, game versus uh, a DFS style game, right? With Sims and uploading CSVs and that sort of thing. So I do think protecting the time is a big one, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know. It's interesting that you said the word seventy. It's now floating rent free in my head here because <laughs> yeah. because I think the the thought process is um, these tools that are being used right now that are additives, whether it be the the sidekick or the caddy or some of the stuff that one week season has, whatever it might be, is kind of just helping you play faster 
And it reminds me of like the first iteration of like poker tracker and hold a manager and this sort of thing where it wasn't giving me answers. It wasn't spitting out the, the correct solved formula. It was just telling me what had taken place at my table while my eyes were diverted elsewhere because my eyes were on another table at another spot at another, whatever. And then I can look back and say, oh man, I, on table 12, I haven't been playing for a while. Holy smokes, the seat three is playing 60% of hands. Wow, mm-hmm. that's noteworthy. And I would have missed it without the tool. I think that's fine. You know, like I think that that uh, that avenue of this for us is fine. What isn't is when all of a sudden table 12 is making its own decision based on that to win versus that opponent, right? Yeah. So that's a very fine line, but the, to like draw the parallel, like in in online poker, you have bots, which are making their own decisions based on all the information that you're talking about. And then you have like these HUDs or these heads up displays or these tools that um, show you three bet fold frequencies and um, like tool numbers that you can use to be a little bit more exploitative. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's it. That's but you still have to make all the decisions. Exactly. Like, it, that that number is irrelevant if you don't know what How that use it. fold range looks like or what that call exactly. range looks like or what that yeah. Exactly. So I'm on I'm in lockstep with you um on that issue. Um furthermore like I don't know what is going into the variables versus decision ma- decision making processes in these tools as in how much is it weighing um, your first 10 round picks versus what's left on the board versus playoff correlation versus closing line value versus ADP versus all these variables. Like, I don't know what it's weighing. I don't think based on what I understand of these current programs, I don't think they are running real time, uh, EV calculations. I think they are, this is the end goal and the end goal that is put into these programs I don't know what that is even like, is it more concerned? Is it like, what is it weighing at each decision point in the game tree? Is it like you get to round 12 and it is more concerned with um, like playoff correlations, team stacks and uh, like, because it should be a sliding scale. Closing line value versus ADP is more beneficial earlier in rounds versus later versus team stacking correlation versus like there's so many variables in these games. And Mm -hmm. then the last thing I'll say about it is we have to understand that these games involve a shit ton of variance. Right. Yeah. So when you're looking at what you can control in your decision making process, that's why we utilize EV when we're talking about these things. Because what does EV assume? It takes out variance from the equation and it assumes an infinite sample size. Mm-hmm. Like we don't have either of those things, but that's all we can control, right? So when we're talking about like roster constructions, 2583-3582 in underdog, where it's an 18-round draft, like those are the those give you the highest EV of roster construction builds in these contests one the ev edge over like a three quarterback three tight end build is not negligible it's the difference is there but it also like that assumes an infinite sample size if we could play out this contest on an infinite time scale the two five eight three three five eight two would win more it would give you the best ev but that does not mean like these other builds cannot win yeah, I mean, like, oh, we don't even have to look that far. We literally look at last year. Last year, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, was it the three six six three build that yep. shipped? Yeah, yeah, that's solid. Yeah. yeah. So all of that discussion, and I brought this out. I tried to bring this out, but I just got shit on on Twitter this past week uh, about my three running back builds, and we've we you and I have talked about this before in the past. Um, real, I get it. I'm not building an entire portfolio of three running back teams. That is something that is okay to mix yeah. in. It's okay. It's going to be okay, guys. We're, we, <laughs> we get it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. This, Save space. <laughs> this, 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 this discussion is, I think, had to be had. Um, anything else mm. to say on the, the, the I don't want to. Well, I, I, I like the, the, the variance angle you brought up that like basically 
you know, the amount of capital that would be required to play every single slate over the entirety of a summer on every single platform, lock it all up in escrow for eight to nine months, and then realize 10 to 12 to maybe an outlier percent ROI yeah. in the future. Um, I, I don't think we can fast track the salt. And I think like games like poker with more clearly defined rules or, you know, even like video games, for instance, I think games like that are way closer to the solve level. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that even with the best AI tools, with the best bot tools, with the best whatever for best ball that we could ever we could swing the pendulum of equilibrium toward it. But I don't think we could ever fully solve it just because of time. And it's because we play one slate at a time, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, that, that that's just like the one thing I would say about tools with best ball. Now, daily slates, that's a completely different angle yeah. because, you know, we could be playing upwards of 50 slates if we're just using NFL, for instance. We could play like 50 plus slates a year, right? Between the Monday, Thursdays and the Thursday, Sundays and the uh, main slates and the, the showdowns and blah, blah, blah. Like that's where then like AI and bot based tools and you know, someone not having to sit beside behind their computer and draft for 30 plus hours. That's where it kind of like concerns me and could kill some ecosystem and suck money out of the games. And they could be faster adapting because you can change the inputs slate to slate. Whereas like best ball, man, like we could need 10 years of testing these tools to then need 10 years to solve with these tools or whatever. Yes. So th I think that's another thing that's like, if anything, if they become table stakes, it's going to incentivize people to do stuff like you've been doing with like three running back build. Because if the new meta is like everyone's drafting in this exact same linear pattern, well, the combinatorial ownership of all those lineups is going to look very, very similar. So yeah. like you could all of a sudden like funnel your way to like some complete exploitative deviation like you're alluding to with that that build so now the question becomes for this year are we jumping the shark by doing so yes. at this point in time uh versus or are we like is the field caught up enough where we actually think 70 percent of drafters right now are utilizing this common knowledge this table stakes now we can start deviating so that becomes a very fun theoretical exercise Yes, I love it, dude. And I don't. That's. I want to close the loop on that by saying I don't necessarily think that like seventy percent of the field is 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 or is going to be using these tools. Mm -hmm. um, more so speaking, to probably seventy percent of the field understands that we need to optimize for the playoffs, optimize for week seventeen. Where is the EV coming from, um, and how do we exploit the field tendencies in that? Um, I don't even know if the number is that high for that. Um, probably not. maybe in maybe in this draft window it is. Um, yeah. just with like, kind of like only the, the hardos and sickos drafting, you know, from pre-draft till mid late June, uh, maybe yeah. going forward that number plummets to, you know, 40% or something like that, where you just get pros starting up their weekly home leagues and they're like, Hey, I got to fire a couple of these drafts in too, kind of deal. So, um, yeah, I mean, 70 is probably high in general and 70 is probably yeah. high when we come to August. But uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the yep. day, like we're th th we got tools that are displaying stuff that like maybe helps them catch up. But let's be real, like the individuals who 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 is a recreational player who's going to spend two hundred bucks on the site that's going to go out and find these tools and then utilize these tools and then win with these tools. Like you know, it's like we're talking about fractions upon fractions upon fractions. Like this is really for the hardos of the hard to just aid their their time basically that also brings up an interesting question do you think that number is influenced because this year we're starting to see a lot more like early bird incentives we're starting to see like hey come draft with us you do 10 drafts we'll give you one for free um they had you know dk and drafters were running promos in uh, may and june um is that do you think that affects that number at all uh, I'd say a little bit. I would say the fact that Underdog just dropped their rake back gladiator program will start to do something too. I mean, yeah. that's no joke when you can get 50% rake back by doing a thousand drafts. Like that's a big number, but that's going to incentivize people to to push the plane and and try and just, you know, oh, $5 puppy, I'm 50 away. Oh, oh 
okay, I guess. And just, yeah, you know, max. fire off that last max or whatever. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's definitely that there's definitely the content cycle. There's definitely the fact that like this and betting and everything has become like a, a lifeblood uh, adjacent industry to the NFL so that the NFL really has no off season anymore. Um, yeah. So I would say, yeah, the combination of media cycle and, and site promotion and that sort of thing, they, they all kind of just, it's all just like a melding pot of that going hand in hand. I dig it, man. We're going to shift gears a little bit here and I'm going to throw you uh, just a super open ended um, question. Uh -oh. And yeah, we'll see where it takes us because I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Um, the the meta, what is the overall like? What does the what does the the what should, I don't know what to say. The the draft meta of this year, where ADP has been, where it's going, where it's at now. How are you seeing this season from a from an NFL best ball standpoint? And we'll we'll talk strictly to playoff style contests because. We've got underdog. We've got DK. There's some other ones, um, smaller. Um, we won't talk drafters or like the the marathon on underdog where it's yeah, cumulative like the cumulative scoring. stuff. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk. Uh, we'll talk just like playoff style contests. What are you seeing from the meta? Obviously, we know like wide receivers are super pushed up. We know that um, tight ends, elite quote unquote tight ends. <laughs> that's that's another discussion point. What does what is an elite tight end? But um, elite tight ends are kind of being pushed down. We've seen quarterbacks pushed down. Um, and then you really only have like three tier one running backs. And then behind that, it's kind of wide open as well. What are you seeing from the overall meta up to this point? And how do you view like optimizing against that? Um, yeah, I'd say the meta right now is some form of uh, zero RB where you dive into that pocket between rounds five and six, because the strength of those running backs are stronger than we've ever seen before, yada, yada, because we've pushed all the wide receivers up. Um, and then we want to make sure we have four to five wide receivers before eight rounds and then one elite tight end and one running back, one quarterback and one or, or two running backs. That's kind of like been the mantra and meta that every streamer and every kind of like conversation is situated around right now. Um, I think it's probably quote unquote, correct. Like I like to use the poker analogies. I'd be like, that's the tag strategy right now like that's the that's the benchmark of like anyone's barrier to entry of like follow these five concrete rules of yeah make sure you fold this here and you fold this here and you raise this here those would probably be like the the obvious ones now i think there's like some really fun deviation that you can get away from that but i do think to some extent you might be shooting yourself in the foot mm -hmm. um that being said i think there are some player archetypes that introduce that like maybe we haven't seen in the past that introduce like some some crazy strategies. Um, I would throw out like a guy like Jaden Daniels potentially like having an RG three rookie year like lazy comp like something like that could, that could really break the mold of some of these builds. I'd throw a, a name like TJ Hawkinson out who people are scared of with the injury and this sort of thing. But when we're thinking toward the playoffs and you're looking for late round tight ends, we know that the ceiling of this player in that KOC offense, uh, regardless, it was quarterback agnostic last year, uh, even if he has a rookie quarterback or Sam Darnold at the helm, that the ceiling of this player is a tight end one on a week-to-week -week basis and tight end one overall potentially as well. I do think like little wrinkles like that, I'd throw out Nick Chubb as well as like, just in terms of like, yeah, these are very high variant uh, situations to ape in on. But if you get those two pieces right, I mean, that's potentially RB1 and tight end one for a three week stretch in the playoffs that are routinely available in like the hundred plus. And we don't have to squint to see it. We don't have to talk about contingency. We don't have to talk about, oh, if the season breaks this way or if this offense is good or that one's bad. Like, like we can literally just go, Hey, this is the best offensive line in football with a propensity to run. And hey, Nick Chubb has been one of the most athletic. Now, is it really scary that he had a bunch of ligaments fall out of his knee for the second time in his life? Absolutely. But like, if yeah. I'm trying to win like an outlier upon outlier of contest, at least I've seen that RB1 ceiling routinely for multiple years now. And then we can talk about 
age curve and we could talk about, you know, coming yeah. back from injury and like all this sort of stuff. But I, I, I just from a macro lens standpoint, uh, to like take that and then dive it into some isolated examples, just some shit I've been experimenting with. I love those two examples um, for one very specific reason. And that's it's they're very polarizing. Um, you'll they're very polarizing from how people talk about those situations, view them. I mean, you'll go on Twitter, search TJ Hawkinson. And it's like, do not draft. He is the biggest do not draft list of the ever draft list history. Um, and it's like, okay, like we don't have to take these like binary stances. You can't, you don't have to be in or out a player throughout your entire portfolio. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, how do I optimize that? Okay. If I, I'll make a rule, we'll go into like the rules of like an optimizer. I'll make a rule. If TJ Hawkinson must be on a three tight end build. Okay. Boom. Mm -hmm. Done. Perfect. Like I, I'm able to take a stance on both sides. Um, a player that's very similar to that to me, um, in that whole meta of like, he's very polarizing um, is George Kittle at the same position. It's like, no, he's super overvalued right now. Um, his wide, his weekly range of outcomes is so wide. It's like, yeah, but his weekly range of outcomes is so wide. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, we yeah. want, we want that. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. This is good. So like I have a rule if George Kittle and I've been attacking George Kittle pretty heavily, if George Kittle must be on a three tight end build, it's just okay. Like, okay. I can take both sides of that. Like, yeah, he has, legitimate wide range of outcomes like he can score three points he can score 30 points on a given week like we know this um not even talking about like will brandon Ayuk be playing there well, i assume he will be but like mm -hmm. even just like his with everybody healthy with debo healthy cmc healthy with Ayuk healthy like george kittle could stay in and block for 80 percent of the snaps if that's in the game plan or if they get you know if they're down by two scores it could happen um like he could be out running an 85, 90% route frequency rate. Like, so the fact that he has a wide range of outcomes is like, how do we manage that? How do we leverage that? How do we like utilize that in our favor? That's just one way that I've kind of done that. And I lump like Hawkinson and Kittle into that same boat because they each have pretty wide range of outcomes um, mm -hmm. from a weekly standpoint. And that's really what matters most in this weekly contest. That we right. Play yeah. Like, yeah, we got to win like three isolated weeks in in the finals there, you know. Um, yeah, it's interesting because like the like I was just thinking about like some of the names that are adjacent to like some of those players. Like going back to the Hawk one, for instance. Like I think about like you know Cole Komet, like he's the fifth or sixth option on his own team. Yeah. Right. Um. It. it, it you think about like um, Ben Sinnott. Like I, I don't know. Is, is Jaden Daniels good? Maybe uh, is he a converted fullback that's now going to be playing tight end? Yeah, like uh, um, yeah, I don't know. And it's like just give me the one that I, I understand the variance, but at least when the variance hits, I know it hits in a huge way. Um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, you and I are very like minded in that. I, I would say something about the onesies positions in in general. Here is uh, mm -hmm. you alluded to the three tight end builds there with Kittle. And stuff. It's something that I've warmed up to. Like we've uh, kind of famously saw, like Dan Zach last year talk a lot about four tight end builds, and kind of maybe went a little too far down uh, that rabbit hole with that uh, yeah. macro strategy with some of the simulations and stuff that he was running. But obviously, just respect his thought process and respect respect anyone who's willing to uh, redefine and break molds and 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 go out there and on a limb on like a stance like that. And just because it didn't work in one isolated year doesn't necessarily mean it was wrong either right mm -hmm. so don't want to lose sight of that but i, I yeah the, the thing is like traditionally speaking i don't think people would be the type of uh like george kittle wouldn't be the type of player that people would normally associate with a three tight end bill right like mm -hmm. that's uh they would be like oh yeah if i'm encapsulating you know the the george kittle spike weeks it's because you know he's leading my team to the promised land he's the elite tight end tier so i, I found it very interesting there Another thing that I've been experimenting with more so this year than in years past was three quarterbacks, even when I have a little bit of draft capital spent at the high side, just because of the value yeah. of correlated stacks in the postseason. Uh, just, you know, I was kind of a bit of a, a nit, I guess, in years past, where like I was pretty tethered to like my two six eight twos and my, you know, two five eight threes and this sort of thing. Because I was like, well, the field's so far behind. If I just build like intelligent correlated lineups with 17 and 16 in mind, we'll be fine. Kind of deal. And now it's like, okay, 
maybe I was wrong in that thought process. I should have been a little bit more experimental with uh, the onesies positions here and introducing some leverage with uh, some skinny stacks like that. So I long-winded way to say that I think I've been very, very flat at the quarterback position this year just in general and taking exploitative stances elsewhere, which sometimes funnels to stacking partners, but I don't try and let it. Uh, funnel me to certain stacking partners. I've been trying to make a concerted effort to be very flat at the quarterback position. That's very interesting. It's also interesting that you bring up the Dan Zach for tight end thing. Um, and I did a lot of work over the past two seasons in analyzing um, Millie Maker in DFS winning rosters versus optimal. And how does that mean anything for us in best ball? Um, I would argue it, it does. And I've been trying to draw those um, that correlation between the two in that, like your chances of winning a GPP. And then we're, yes, this is the Millie Maker versus like in week 17, we're talking about like a sub 600 person contest. So it's not apples to apples. Uh, as you hear my kid screaming in the background. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of closer year. to winning like the spy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like the, the, the secondary spy or the tertiary spy, right? Yeah. Like the ones yeah. that are are lower, um, smaller field sizes. Um, but your your chances of winning those contests go up exponentially. You know, if I do not have the exact number. I don't want to throw out a number that's wrong. Um, I've done the work. You see my work on one week season. But um your your chances of winning those tournaments go up exponentially if you have a top three performer at both quarterback and tight end in a DFS setting. So if we like back engineer that to best ball, like what does that mean for us in an isolated week when we're playing against a 600 sub 600 person field or however like many people are in the championship round, we'll say. Um, well, it should tell us that like we should be striving to get quarterbacks and tight ends at the onesie positions that have a chance to end the week in the top three. Like, what does that look like? We saw two years ago, Cole Komet kind of came out of nowhere, um, had multiple multi-touchdown games. Um, but the the big thing there is like, what does that mean for the rest of my roster? How do I get there and put myself in a position to leverage that information? Um, something that I've brought out is quarterback and tight end pairings on a team because those are two positions that rely heavily on touchdowns um, for fantasy value. So double dipping on that. There are other ways, but like, that's what I mean by like, yeah, a, a, a borderline RTA or a tool can like tell us how to construct a roster or how to correlate week 17, but it can't tell us like, how do we take what we know and turn it into something that gives us an, an appreciable edge. So there's like so many other examples. So I like the fact that you brought up like Dan Zach in, in talking about that because he very clearly recognized through his Sims and through running his um, his programs or whatever he was doing behind the scenes. Um, like he very clearly realized that like getting a top performer at tight end is is an edge in a weekly setting. And that is not to say that like he was wrong because he might have just been quote unquote wrong last year because Sam Laporta was a 12th round draft pick and right. ended the season as like the tight end one. So like, was that the the reason, the causal factor that led to that being quote unquote wrong? Probably. Is there a tight end this year in the 12th round or later that is going to finish top three at the position? Uh, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. So like, mm -hmm. there's so many variables there that like, we don't know. That's why I yeah. love this game, man. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's why we talk about like, you know, we're so far away from being so far away on like the solved notion, right? Because like yeah. we can't even we can't even come up with these uh answers right now because the player examples are so densely specific to year to year, right? It's like last year we had some of the biggest outliers ever. Like we yeah. literally had the biggest outliers ever in Puka, Kyron, and Sam Laporta, right? Mm -hmm. Like those are some of the biggest uh ADP to positional output outliers we may ever see, right? And the funny thing is, I guess two years prior to that, we had another one with one of the greatest wide receiver seasons ever from a fifth round wide receiver in Cooper Cup. And mm -hmm. then you juxtapose that in a two year window, we saw the best outlier performance ever from a wide receiver in the fifth round, then somewhat get usurped by two players on his own team yeah. two years later when we still thought this guy was like a top five pick. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just, that's, that's how stark 
experience is on a, on a year to year basis for us. Like you and I have loved to allude to every time, like just on a contest to contest iteration, because the, you know, I'm, I'm kind of cracking up as we're having this conversation, looking at the b- background of the overlay here and just some of these names, you know, yeah. like <laughs> I'm looking up here and I see oh, Austin Eckler in the 14th round. Well, Austin Eckler's RB 38 right now on, on underdog, like Josh Allen firmly entrenched in the second round here goes in the fourth routinely now on yeah. our site. Same with Mahomes. Like it, it's just crazy, man. Like Justin Fields, you can have for free. You want to talk about pendulum of variance. Here he's going at pick 23 in this picture, and you yeah. can have him for free as your tackle on third quarterback in the 18th round almost every single time in non-superflex. Like, you don't think that's the, the potential largest ceiling chasing outcome on the entirety of best ball slates? Absolutely, man. If you spent like 80% of your rosters on Justin Fields in the last round, I would never fault you. That is mm-hmm. like one of the biggest outliers ever like uh, yeah it's it's crazy yeah this is great man this is why we play this is why we talk about it too man right, I love yeah. it. we're all we're both getting hyped over here like <laughs> <laughs> well it's um, fun because like the the thing that nez and i uh, joke about all the time because we do the show daily right yeah and we 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 focus so much on like isolated slates and you know seeing these slates play out over and over again uh you, you know like i had a, a shit ton of otani yesterday for instance at 39 percent Otani, I had, you know, had him in all my single entry. I had him all this stuff, right? And it's like, yeah, he was the best play on the slate. He was the best chalk play. He was the highest projecting. And I was lucky enough to roll the 101 enough times to get him. And like, he doesn't matter at all. And I I lose 90% of buy-ins, even when he, (laughs) even when he homers and scores two runs and steals a base and like whatever. And it's just like, yeah, well, what's the analogy for that to a best ball contest over the entirety of a full season? It's like, that we're going to watch it play out. And I think that's why I think uh, football content and best ball content is so great because you could literally just sit down with someone. And if you guys are both deep in the trenches, we could just talk about Justin Fields for, you know, 35 minutes and we, we would never have anything the wiser. Like, you know, it's just, I, I don't know, long kind of like just winded way of saying that, like, I think the the trickle down effects of like the the content associated with these games and like getting excited about it is just because like of the we don't know factor. Plus, it takes so long to play out that we can literally dive into like we could do a show over the course of the year and talk about every single individual player that gets drafted with an ADP and we still wouldn't have a game by the time we got there, you know, like, yeah, yeah. You've uh, you've brought up this multiple times. I've brought up this multiple times. Talking about variants, talking about the stuff that we can't h- handle uh, or manage. Um, well, that I'll get there. Just bear with me. Um, <laughs> it's not that we can't handle or manage variants. Uh, it's how we do it. Um, we're talking about wide range of outcomes, guys. Justin Fields in the 18th, TJ Hawkinson, Nick Chubb, um, George Kittle, all these guys. And you brought up one statement that I think encapsulates all of that is understanding variants. We have to understand that this exists. We have to understand that there's so much shit in this con in these contests that we cannot control, but we can manage it. We can leverage it. We can utilize it in our favor, but we have to understand it first in order to have this like starting point of, okay, knowing this, how do I then build that into my thought process, build that into my decision-making matrix, my, my process, my game plan, however you want to conceptualize that statement it all kind of stems from like understanding variance. Does it not? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, people talk about it in different terms. Like they'll talk about it as like better in best ball. They'll talk about um, spike week players. They'll talk about um, uh, player archetype will be like a one that's yeah. used a lot. Uh, yeah. And I think if you just dumb it all down or, or maybe you gal brain it all up, yeah, you know, everyone's talking <laughs> the about way. the yeah. You go the other way with it. Everyone's talking about the same thing, and it's about how you manage variance uh, amongst like roster creation, right? And and I mean, and it goes another step further is how do you manage variance across like portfolio portfolio building, and then how do you manage that across multiple sites if you're playing, you know, if you're chasing that uh, elusive like 500 drafts for this summer or something like that. Um, you know, we talk about a guy. I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, hit him with the gritty is a player on underdog. Have you seen his exposures and stuff? Like it's, it's 
so so hyper exploitative um and that is literally just a exercise in risk tolerance and mm-hmm. it is an exercise in it, it's not right or wrong on how to play it doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with the take uh it's literally just an exercise in personal risk tolerance associated with variance if chase claypool somehow has 800 and and for those who don't know this guy famously has almost 90 percent chase claypool in his portfolio over you know 100 and whatever plus drafts already um if if chase claypool somehow finds his way to like 800 and like nine or something like this like 800 and and eight uh you know i i don't know if he's going to be rolling in it or you'd assume he would be but i still don't know like just in terms of like how you manage variants in and of a roster. So I think it's just one isolated example as to like, uh, how, does it matter? How does it matter? And is it just risk tolerance versus like, you know, intelligent construction building? 100%. Um, before we continue, I do got to mention down there at the bottom of the screen, if you're new to drafters, use code OWS for 100% match on your first deposit up to 100 bingo bangos. Again, OWS over at drafters for new users will get you some free entries that is always a good thing talking about free entries man we mentioned underdog uh giving some rake back um that can be free in season entries baby or just cash it out man uh (laughs) there's no shame in that either Um, (laughs) drafters running some good promos underdog running some good promos we got dk getting into the promo streets with um some of their early bird stuff so go take advantage i mean we're talking about ev and things you can control Go get free money where they're giving it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that yeah. is a boost to EV. So uh, shout outs to kind of all the you know platforms in the industry now handing out free money. So that is always a plus. Um, let's shift gears now and talk about some of the other contests that are being offered mm-hmm. on Underdog. You know, we sure. we spent we spent some time talking about um, you know your standard playoff um, style contest. There's, you know, Underdog has given us some solid offerings. You know, we they introduced weekly winners last year, um, the Eliminator last year. This year, they're up in the game. They brought those back. They're also giving us cumulative scoring. Um, they're giving us a cumulative scoring in the playoffs only, a la something similar to what we see at FFPC. Um, talk to me a little bit about, like, how do we alter our, our mindset for these different style of contests? Uh, yeah, I think it's a really good conversation to have because like, um, for me, I think about the first thing is time box versus uh, longevity of draft window is like the very first thing I, I think about in terms of yep. what's different in contest. The second thing I would think of is just that like BBM is its own beast, its own entity. Like we talk about BBM in very different ways than we talk about any other style of basketball contest. And I think that's sometimes lost on people where like, there should be a caveat before like everything, a little disclaimer at the bottom of the screen. We are now talking about BBM five, yeah. right? Because it is, it is in of itself just so, so different with mm-hmm. in terms of advancement and that sort of thing. Uh, another beautiful thing, like in terms of advancement that underdogs done is they've like, uh, they've made that, uh, information like just readily available right in your face you can't miss it when you click on the tiles for the drafts they used to have to go back into like the rules and then it was like micro edges like here's another okay to tie that into the tools yes here's go. something that we used to think was an edge in our games to be like hey here's a hundred dollar contest everyone thinks it's the same no it's completely different because we're advancing four out of 12 and then we're yeah. advancing one out of six and one out of eight so this is actually, yeah this is actually a yeah. week 16 focused contest versus a week 17 focused contest right so it's like that used to be an edge in our format right because you used to go have to find that information you used to have to think through it now table stakes it's basically like underdog has made the hud for you because you just click on the tile and all that information is right there for you. We know that the sprint is 3,700 person final, for instance, right? Like we know it's two out of 12 and then just 3,700 entries that you got to beat kind of deal. So yeah. I, I find it very interesting. Um, I think the biggest thing would be like weeks to focus on in terms of correlation for some of those finals one, as I just alluded to, I was a firm believer in the Dalmatian that week 16 was more important than week 17. So I was doing some form of like over correlating week 16 because 
I was going to let the, you know, I'm still trying to balance both, I guess, uh, on certain rosters, yeah. but I was definitely focusing a little bit more on, and it's so hard to get out ahead of our skis on like, what's the best week 16, what's the best week 17, but we work within the confines in which we have of implied team totals, implied game totals, whatever, at this point in time, perceived weather and, and, and game environments, this sort of thing. But for, for, for I was definitely focused on like, this is a week 16 contest and then let the chips fit fall where they may for like the 64 person final uh with the cumulative scoring one uh i think i've been aping in to like for the sprints that we've done i've been over correlating my teams in kind of like a mega onslaught stacky kind of way in terms of like you know rising tide lifts all ships kind of deal where it's like if we just look at uh i'll use the raiders for example Raiders have a really nice three dome slash, um, th- sorry, three, uh, not dome, but like outdoor good condition plus uh, indoor game environments there. Let me think. Um, Raiders are Atlanta, Saints. Jacksonville, and Saints in 17. Mm-hmm. So like if you just look at the surface, like in terms of like price point, like nobody really wants to get to Gardner Minshew. Nobody really wants to get to AOC. Nobody really wants to get to Michael Mayer. No one wants to get to Trey Tucker, like this sort of thing. But if yeah. you just break even down, Jacoby, like, man, shit. Yeah, even Jacoby, like Jacoby's like so underpriced relative to his skill set, especially with Hunter Renfro gone. Yeah, we could dive into like these isolated player takes over and over again. But like it was just like a macro like team that I was like, huh. Like if we were playing daily slates for like, and we were looking for like contrarian underpriced stacks for like this week, and we were doing, you know, what your guys' building blocks would be or something like this. And we were looking for a three man stack under 18,000 or something like that. Couldn't you just see us going like Brock Bowers, Gardner Minshew, Jacoby Myers in a game versus Atlanta in week 15. And then you could see yourself doing it again versus the Jags in a potential shootout in a good weather game there. And then you can see yourself doing it again in a dome game that might have some divisional implications or some playoff implications. Anyways, long ass tangent to just be like, I was really looking at like, Hey, what's this cumulative process? What could this team do? Okay. Let me stack like four guys from this team. And it was kind of weekly winners esque in terms of mindset. Um, And will it kill potentially kill some form of like advance rates and like getting to the playoffs. Absolutely. Absolutely. But am I willing to trade that for what I think I'm getting in terms of EV in the finals there? Yeah. Because I'm probably trading. That's a $50 entry. I'm probably trading. Let's call it like $44 after I draft. And then I think I have an edge. It's like 46. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, then you get to those playoff weeks and it's worth like, 280 instead of somebody else's who's advanced one and it's worth like 180. So I was Mm -hmm. looking for like that EV split difference come the finals comparative to like early in the season and advance rate mindset based. All right. No, I love that discussion. (laughs) I also think that highlights an interesting um, micro edge. We'll say um, in that, like all of these things matter. All of these things are part of the EV equation. It is an equation. It is not just like a number that can, pops out of like, I don't know, pops out of somewhere. Um, I'll let you guys use your imagination. Um, but it, it, all these things contribute to EV. And again, we use EV because it eliminates the variance. It eliminates the things we can't control. Um, we, all these things contribute. So that's why that brings us back to like how we started this, the show in that, like, I haven't seen the the behind the scenes of some of these tools. I don't know what they are considering important, what they're waiting, what variables they're waiting, where um, does that change with each pick that's made? Because in the EV calculation, that stuff does change based on what you've done before, based on all these different variables. And like, I don't know if those are weighted properly. I don't know what's weighted. I don't know any of that stuff. So like, mm-hmm. not that I doubt like the, the efficacy of the tool or like it, the, I doubt that it will help you be a better drafter. Like it most definitely does, but mm-hmm. I don't know what's going on. I, I, I'd assume, I don't know for sure, but I assume those tools are not running EV calculations with each player that comes off the board because for, if, if we're talking about like the truth of expected value, that number and that, that contribution to who you should pick 
is going to change with not just each of your selections, but every selection off the board. Right. And I mean, even if they are doing that in real time and they were like, you know, they did have some formula for how they were amending EV, like it's pretty hard to say at this point in time without like so much back testing, if it's correct, if it's, um, you yes. know, actually swinging the pendulum of your, of your entries. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's a very, it's a very sophisticated con uh, conversation to have. Yeah. Yeah. We could talk about this for just that one discussion point for three hours. <laughs> that, yeah. And, 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 like there's also like inherent biases toward it too, because they've baked in their own player rankings and they've banked in yes. their own projections. So like, I always go back to like the Utical like point where it was just like so simplistic and it just made so much sense. It's just like knowing ball is in the projection. The projection mm -hmm. is knowing ball, right? So it's just like at the at the root of it all, whether you're using the tool, whether it's live calculating EV, whether it's whatever, it's all of those decisions are like all the foundationary piece is the projection, right? Mm -hmm. So it just it is, you know, if the projection isn't sound, then then it's not. And that's not to say that there's aren't or anybody else in the industry is not. I'm just saying that there's a reason that there are, you know, what, 10, 15 different sites now making best ball based projections for the entirety of the season. And they all look different. They, they show, they overlap in some form of similarities, but they all look different and they're all deemed very intelligently built. Right. So yes. it's kind of like, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's end this with a discussion on that real quick, because we'll give a little backstory and then we'll talk about why that matters for how we develop our strategy. Um, ADP is initially set based on these median projections over season long, right? That's where ADP comes from at the beginning of all these contests. It's going to be different on DraftKings, going to be different on underdogs, going to be different on drafters. Um, one, because those formats are different, half PPR versus full. Two, versus their different starting points for median projections over a season. Mm -hmm. If we know that, how then does ADP move for the rest of the draft cycle? It's influenced by two big things in my mind. It's influenced mm -hmm. by um, the overall industry, like the, uh, who are we talking about when that's going to influence ADP. And then it's influenced by things that we can't control at the start being injuries, being, um, um, camp battles, being, uh, depth chart shakeouts, being all these that your coaching changes. I, I don't know if that could happen between now and then all these things mm -hmm. that like we can't control are going to influence ADP from the rest, from when we started till when we end. That's important to understand. And this should give us an idea of like, how do how does our draft strategy change as we start getting more information, um, which it should. And I don't know if it's mm -hmm. going to in the meta, um, but where we see the biggest magnitude in ADP movements is typically at the running back position. And that's easy to understand because that is the position that is the fantasy value is most closely tied to volume. And that is something that can change with a snap of a finger. Um, so. Knowing that, knowing like from when we started to when we end in, in you know, the first couple of weeks of September, understanding that running back ADP is likely to be the biggest magnitude of movements. How does that shift our game plan as we continue drafting these? Yeah, I mean, it definitely makes the scroll the F down stuff way more attractive later in the draft window. Um, just in terms of like once we have like clarity and stuff like that, it does make it like more powerful. Um, you know, just being able to uh, have a clear stance between like Isaac Grando and Elijah Mitchell, for instance, right yeah. now, whereas like both of them are getting drafted right now. So I, I would do, I, I, I would say that um, I, I don't know, in a long, like kind of winded way, you kind of like just re-explained uh, what zero RB is right now. Is it not like yeah. that's kind of like the, the, the thesis behind it all is like the volatility at the position that introduces the variance in which we want to chase comparative to all the other positions in which we're drafting. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think it leads to wanting to be more diversified at the running back position than the majority of other positions. I would say the most condensed I will be, will be between tight end and wide receiver. And then I will have scatter shot quarterback and running back as like a macro uh, theory, but I do think it also speaks to like draft window. And that's where we go back to like time box versus BBM because in a time box uh, contest right now, 
if you know that like, hey, puppy two is only going to be open for like five days or whatever it may be, uh, I could see yourself getting like super dense around like isolated running backs that you think are mispriced. I could see mm-hmm. you getting super dense over running backs that you think are only going to move up when recreational drafters uh, come in a la Derrick Henry in like BBM or something like that. And you could focus on like closing line value for elongated draft window contest. That being said, it is the hardest position, in my opinion, to build a portfolio around, which means it probably should be the flattest, um, just in terms of the volatility associated with it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'd throw that back at you. What do you think? Yeah, so I've I've done, put a lot of thought into this and how it affects um, our governing strategy. And my conclusion was um, we should be zero hero heavy through the first three months of drafting before we start getting more of this news. And then once we start getting more of these shakeouts in ADP, once we, you know, it's ADP is never going to approach equilibrium. We know this, but it's going to be more close to perfect more efficient. Right. Um, Once we start getting more news, once we start seeing these camp breakouts, once we start seeing who's going to be injured, um, we can then like transition from this like zero and hero heavy mindset to now like bringing in some more building styles. So like, for example, I think I just checked, I'm like 236 underdog drafts in right now. Um, Almost all of them have, I don't want to put a percent on it, but this is my governing strategy right now. It's like almost all of them have been hero and zero builds. And rotating in who those are, why they are three running back bills. I'm sorry. Crucify me. Um, <laughs> ro- rotating in all these different you know, methodologies and, and ways to harness that um, within that kind of mindset. And then that's going to shift. Um, so like over my next, you know, 500 drafts, once camp starts, because we're going to be packing them in once, like we start getting more information, right. Um, what those are, maybe 20% of them are going to be zero hero. Um, and, and why is that? Because like the players that are now moving up, like we're eighth, ninth rounders. Like what if Jonathan Brooks is like this, his knee is no big issue. And he's like, Oh, we're going to ride him into the ground. Um, and that comes out in camp or preseason. Like what if Zach Moss is like stepping directly into the Joe Mixon role or what if he's not, what if, yeah, right. I know (laughs) those, what ifs like are what you leverage now and you do that via zero hero and then like once we start getting the the answers or the peek behind the curtain to those what ifs we can adjust a little little accordingly so that's how i've been handling it um i was interested to hear like your thoughts on that it's the og uh if then statements that uh one week season is so famous for i mean and i love it man we always came back to those uh when looking for leverage in the daily slates right it's like mm-hmm. if so and so fails it, you juxtapose it to this guy succeeding or you get direct leverage off of you know if if uh Jamar Chase doesn't go off in week 17 and and we're building a team that Jeff- Justin Jefferson does well what does that mean for like the Bengals for instance well perhaps that means that we still think they're in a good spot. We still think they're going to put up points that week that we're leveraging directly off of that with Zach Moss. So like the yes. extent of taking Zach Moss is that like we're soft fading Jamar Chase and we're, you know, putting Justin Jefferson ahead of him or something like that. So I, I do think like when you think through like the entirety of the game tree like that, uh, it just makes for very fun ideological and, and thought process. Um, I'm glad you brought up the Zach Moss. I'm looking at my exposures right now. We're going to run. Uh, an exposure based uh, show. Um, yeah, I, I am. I admittedly, as I said, I, I am pretty flat comparative to, you know, some of the other stuff that I've, I've seen around, but yeah. uh, my highest exposed running back right now is Zach Moss, uh, but it's only 21%. So ah, yeah. Here. So let's see if you can see this. 39 Zach Moss. Yeah. Zach Moss at the top 39. Yeah. What do you got below that? Jonathan Brooks and who? 31, Jonathan Brooks. Uh, hold on, let me pull it up again. I just closed it. Uh, yeah, it, it's all in that same like meta mindset that kind of led to that. Like, I'm not going to end with 39% Zach Moss, but that's right. kind of, that's where, um, oh, it's the Chargers backfield, dude. Gus Edwards, 29%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just like aping into the ambiguity of uh, of the variance associated with that. Yeah, mine's Moss. 
uh, Josh Jacobs, Mixon, Jaleel McLaughlin, Charbonnet. Nice, dude. I dig it. That's right at an hour, dude. We blew through that hour. So we're going to end it there. I don't want to make these too long winded, but as I always, one dude, last question. Yes. Yes. I don't want to interrupt, but I, I no, have to get interrupt. it. Get it. Please. Who, please. Who, whom is your highest exposed player in general right now? Uh, Cooper Cup. Hey, same. Look nice. the, is it really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's 35 percent for me 35 that's cute dude yeah i know yeah yeah it's definitely Just, uh you know uh, it's definitely yeah. like that's what i was saying man like my macro flat this year yeah um my highest owned player um just looking at weekly games so this is like a hundred and something 140 something teams so far i have like a shit ton of slows cooking um cooper cup 69 percent up to this wow. point john o. smith 50 percent Brandon Cooks, 46%. Khalif Raymond and DeAndre Hopkins, 45%. Cool. Yeah, I like all those names, to be honest. Yeah, and that's just the hyper-exploitative leveraging through zero hero RB builds, and then that'll change, and yada, yada, yada. Oh, that's good mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, it's something that we talked about in the past uh, a lot, where we were talking about, like, the the I know ball window, the IKB, the that sort yeah. of thing. Is this window of time? You know? Yeah, and exactly. Then, so. And then as prices adjust and, and change, like the, the IKB guys with the CLV right now that are that are slapping is the, the guys that were doing Jalen Hurts stacks or Jalen Hurts double stacks on the right hand side of the board early in BBM because, you know, that's not readily available anymore now that Devonta Smith has pushed all the way up to the left side and is so frequently paired uh, with CD Lamb for that week 17 correlation. So like just, you know, thinking through some of these that, uh, you know, combinatorially, we won't have access to anymore. Yeah, hundred percent, dude. I love it. There's so much in there that we could talk. Um, draft windows, <laughs> like the draft. I, I mean, like draft windows, draft cycles, like all the the variables that change the information. I love it, man. I always love talking <laughs> well, to you. The funniest thing is, like, when we started this show, we started with uh, Omaha eight high low stuff, and we were yeah. talking about. <laughs> I was telling you a, a hand history from last night that I played yeah. in, in an online game. Like it was just so funny that just like how we just swing from like thing to thing and get lost in the shuffle and then bounce some player takes in there. It's fun. Yeah. It's always well, a that's blast good. You, dude. Yeah. We, I was, I was telling you how I prefer PLO eight now because I can be more exploitative as compared to no limit. So it's like, we're always looking for those edges, man. Yeah, especially in the live setting forum where like you tend to gravitate towards playing more exploitatively and not seeing those players over and over again for the rest of your life. Like you can stray from like some of the GTO principles and you're not just grinding against the same regs over and over again. It leans yeah. into like being even more kind of like exploitative. Like you just go for three or four sessions in Vegas on a weekend. Like your edge is probably way higher playing something like that and realizing it than yeah. Yeah, we digress. That's good <laughs> stuff, man. That's good stuff. Um, yeah. We're going to have to jam again, dude, at some point. Um, sure. Whether I come on uh, Batch Bros or whether you come back here or both or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I always love talking with you guys uh, and you in particular. Um, again, John Warner, you can find him on Twitter uh, or X at Roto underscore run. Find his work over with the Badge Bros, partnered again. Uh, I saw you guys re-upped your... Um, partnership with underdog so that's big stuff dude as well so congrats to that um again go follow john go follow uh his partner in crime inez um and check out the badge bros but until next time y'all i'm hilo you know what the deal is we are doing these five days a week uh you can always find our content head over to one week season get signed up for best ball plus um and you get five of these a week uh with heavy heavy theory till next time my dude i we will talk and we'll see you in the draft lobbies man one week season.